how long into the industry before you start to think, I've pushed away all these people that I love and I'm not happy. And yeah. I, how, how long is that time period? Yeah, so for me, um, I, I think like to, to revisit a question you asked earlier, you said, can you make money in this industry? For me, I, you know, someone who I grew up not having a father in my home yet, the father, um, he was in the same town. Grew up in a very small town in South Carolina and the added dynamic was I saw him, I knew he was my father, but he was never a father in my home or my life. Did he acknowledge that you were his son? Uh, yes, but, but, that, but that was it. There was no, um, there was like a few attempts. And um, yeah, so there was a few attempts for him to, to be part of my life in some capacity, but he ended up getting married and then, you know, you know he was, they were both 16 at the time and my mom chose to keep me and he chose to, you know, continue living his life. And I would see him, and that made me feel, what's wrong with me? Yeah. Spe like it was confusing at first, and then it made me angry. Specifically because I saw this man in this healthy dynamic. Like he, like mm -hmm. he was married, and they had kids, and they had a nice home, and you know, they, they had all these things, and it was just me and my mom struggling. Wow. Most people who grow up without a father, I mean, what do I know? I just, I guess in my imagination of this, the father is on the other side of the world. The father sure. is just not there. I imagine it's much, much harder yeah. if you see this guy yeah. and you it, see his new family. Yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely different aspects of fatherlessness where it's like some you know someone in my case or like there's a there's there's various you know traumas that come with levels of fatherlessness like yeah. divorce or maybe some a father that's in the home but he's not present. But there's but yes to your point. It was very frustrating that the thing that I felt like I needed most and the thing that I wanted most was in arm's reach, but had no interest in me. Were you aware of this at the time or you were just angry and you didn't know why? Well, I, I was confused until I was angry, and, but I was always aware, you know, because I, he was there. Right. You know, so that caused, so me having a high achiever personality, it's like, well, I can outwork my feeling of lack. I can overcome my feeling of worthlessness or my need to be valuable. So through affirmation, it was, you know, first it was scholastics, then it was sports, then it was getting the girl that no one else could get, then getting the most girls and, and so on and so on. But being in that industry, that personality trait came with me, both me feeling inadequate and me feeling like I need to prove myself. Right. So being someone who is somewhat analytical, I love statistics, and it's like, okay, just I'm tracking literally on a spreadsheet. Once I make a million dollars, then I'll be happy. Yeah. I'll be fulfilled. It's like, so I'm like tracking it like it's some kind of game. I do it. I make a million dollars. And guess what? It didn't work. Yeah. And then the same thing, like in the industry, I, I got nominated for uh, Performer of the Year. I got nominated three years in a row. Didn't win, didn't win, didn't win. Fourth year, I won it. And I thought like that was like the Mount Rushmore of porn yeah. because it was this big award show. And then it was not only the, the actors and the actresses, but the, you know, the organizations, the studios, like they voted on it. So that meant like, you're the guy. And I won. And when I won, I thought that it would bring me this sense of relief, this, this, this feeling of lack, this frustration, this pain. I thought I would experience joy and fulfillment. And I did for a second. And it, but it didn't work, it didn't last. And that quickly amplified my anxiety, deepened my depression, it mm. took me to a place where decision after decision after decision led me to a, I, okay, I'm now making a plan to take my life. So at that point, you are truly the dog who <clears throat> catches the car. There yeah. is nowhere else for you to go. Yeah. You've made a lot of money, yeah. you're the number one guy, there is, n there is no achievement to get Right. In this line of work. Right. I never got into video games, except for a little period of time. Yeah. When, when I was like five years old, I played Donkey Kong. And then when I was a teenager, I got a kick out of Grand Theft Auto. Oh, yeah. Because it was yeah. so crazy. It was so, you know, you just keep running people over and yeah. flying helicopters into buildings, doing all this crazy stuff. Yeah. And I remember, though, playing the video game in this aimless way. Not on the missions, just yeah. aimlessly shooting people or whatever, yeah. robbing things. Yeah. And after a certain point, I realized this was pointless. And I'd just go kill myself in the game. And 
I've thought back on that at some point over the years, and I think there's something profound in that intuition, that if you're aimless and you're just doing things for pleasure, and then you reach what would yeah. appear to be the maximum amount of pleasure, I've never considered ending my life. Right. But I think intellectually I could see how someone could get to that place. Yeah. And you get to that place. Yeah. Yeah, I, I literally got to a place where, so I, <clears throat> it's interesting. So I, I just came from, uh, I, was, I was doing a speaking engagement in Atlanta and um, it was the first time I've been back to Atlanta since the last time I left Atlanta. The last time I left Atlanta was 11 years ago and that's what I had done my last film. You did the, a, a porn film in Atlanta? In Atlanta, okay. um, 11 years ago. And then I'm you know, flying back to LAX and in my head, I'm like mag making the decision like, okay, I'm gonna take my life when I get home, go home, I get enough, I, I do some, some research and say how, how much, you know, these pain medications like, would I have to take to overdose? I get it, I line them up on the counter. I'm like, okay, I can't swallow this many pills at once, but so this, and then um, I've got this check in my pocket and it's just like, it's just driving me crazy. It's, it's, it's this giant like cashier's check. And I just feel it in my pocket, I'm wearing slacks and I just feel it against my skin, it's driving me crazy. I'm not sure why I'm so aware of it. And then I, I take it out and I start thinking like, well, if I'm gonna do this, um, you know, I, I assume my, my bank account will go to my mom or my brother or something like that. So um, I'll go deposit this check and then I'll come back and take care of this. And I walk into this bank and normally I would just go to the Dropbox or the ATM because on the memo of the check, it said what it was for. Like it would have the title of the, the movie, which was always grotesque. And I was humiliated. Yeah. I didn't want to look someone in the eye and say, hey, here's the check for me selling myself for sex. I didn't want to do that. But today, on, on this day, I didn't care. I was like, whatever, I don't care. And I went through the line, you know, sign the check, slide, slide the check across the counter, normal transaction. And I pivot to walk away and she kind of stops me and she says, excuse me, Joshua, are you okay? Joshua, can I do something for you? And what she didn't know is it had been over a year since I had heard my name. I'd stopped answering my mom's text. I'd gotten rid of, um, like I've unfriended anyone that followed me on social media that was like from my actual life, my fraternity brothers, my friends from high school, my brother. I wasn't returning any texts. I wasn't returning any calls. The only person that it existed was my stage name, which everyone on set called me. Everyone knew me, I was very well known. So the gym that I went to, the barbershop that I went to, like everywhere that I went, that's all that I heard. Joshua did not exist, but when she said my name, it stopped me in my tracks and it wrecked me. Because all of a sudden I was faced with what was real. Because at that moment I'd created this plausible reality based on lies, guilt, and shame. Up to and including if the stage name guy kills himself, well, who cares, he's just, he's right. not real. Yeah. But, what, but if Joshua kills himself, yeah, Joshua was a kid. Yeah. Joshua has a mom. Yeah. Joshua is pissed off at his dad. Joshua has a brother. Yeah. So for me, I like what I felt immediately was guilt and regret from not letting my mom know if I was okay. Like that was the last few text messages that she sent me. She's like, you know, dang it, just tell me if you're okay or not. Like if you're not going to come home, if you're going to stay doing whatever you're doing, whatever. I just wanna know if you're okay. And I was so selfish and so caught up in my shame and my pride that I couldn't even pick up the phone or send a text to let my mom know that I was alive. And in that moment, when I heard my name that my mom had given me, my reality was challenged and I felt the pain that I was numb to. So I ran home and I called my mom. And then my mom said what she had been saying for, you know, I'd been in LA for eight, nine years, something like that, but I was in the industry for six. And she said the same thing she had said, I love you, you're better than this, please come home. So I did. So that day I called my agent, I called my PR person, quit, I quit, I quit, I'm out of here. I even like found someone to sublease my place. I'm like, I don't care, you know, just, pay rent, you can have right. li literally, 
have everything in my home, like all my furniture, everything. I'm going to take some clothes, and I'm, I'm out of here. There's this odd paradox. On the one hand, you're behaving in this extremely selfish way. On the other hand, you've completely neglected yourself and yeah. denied the existence of yourself. Yeah. I say it's a paradox because I don't think it's, it's exactly a, a contradiction or an impossibility. Yeah. In fact, very often that would appear to be how these things go. Killing yourself is yeah. both extremely selfish and a, sure. and a complete rejection of the self. How, does, how is that? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's an interesting thing to struggle with because on the outside, aesthetically, you know, I was taking very good care of myself, but mm. I was dying inside. Mm. And I think, you know, that, that's why it's so much easier to put on a mask and pretend, you know, for me, I just wanted the person in front of me to like me or to do the thing to get the affirmation. I didn't care about anything else. But I was disillusioned and disconnected from reality. The power of the name is so striking yeah. because we think, oh, wh who cares about a name? You can have a nickname, you can change your name, it's no big yeah. deal. That's just words, words, words. We call, th I, you know, I call this a glass, but I could call this a parakeet, wouldn't, right? It's just sure. whatever, it's just whatever it is. But that isn't true. Names do matter quite a lot. Yeah. The first charge given to Adam in the Garden of Eden is yeah. name everything. Yeah. All the way up to modern day, this big political fight that everybody seems to be in right now over transgenderism right. is basically a fight over names yeah. and the relationship between names and reality. If you yeah. call me Johnny or you call me Mary Sue, it's not going to, if you call me Rachel Maddow, I'll probably yeah. laugh. <laughs> but if you say that to someone who is in the transgender movement, sure. That person will lose it if you mispronoun or misgender, meaning yeah. use the correct pronouns for somebody. This is the worst crime you can possibly commit against them because they know the power of a name. I mean, yeah. even the the transgender transition is a kind of ritual suicide, right? Where you say, "Okay, my old self—that's my yeah. dead name. That's a dead person. I forget that person. Yeah. I'm this new person." It's hard not to see a, a parallel to what you're describing in the industry. Sure, sure. And, and that and I think in a, in, a, in a deeper way, in any aspect, it's like it's an identity crisis. Yeah. If my identity is rooted in a belief around a feeling or a behavior and I identify myself based on that, yeah. I'm going to constantly be in this identity crisis because there's actually an author of life that's given me an identity that I, I don't get to choose who or what I am but I can feel a certain way, but my feelings can't define me because I've already been defined by an author. I, I, I was talking to a exorcist on this show, actually, and we were talking about selling your soul to the devil. And he said, well, you know, you can't actually do that. Right. I said, what do you mean you can't do that? He says, well, you don't own your soul. Yeah. No, yours. You know, you didn't make your own life. You didn't. Yeah. Cons you didn't craft your soul, and yeah. so you can't sell it either. The devil tricks you and makes you think you can sell it. Sure. You, you actually can't sell it. You, you can't totally define yourself. We yeah. try to do that a lot, sure. but you can't. You didn't choose how you came into this world. You damn well sure shouldn't choose how you go out of the world. Right. And so you have obligations to other people. And so this bank teller, <clears throat> providentially, say, yeah. calls out, says your name. Yeah. This hits you. You call your actual mother, not yeah. your invented personas. Right. Yeah. I Casper. call my mom, and then, and then I run home, and uh, and then I spend two years just doing everything I can to cover up what I'd done. Yeah. You know, I, I literally, I, I had tattoos, covered them up with new tattoos. You know, shaved my head, deleted my social media, hmm. did everything that I could to hide what I'd done. Like, like very, like Genesis two, Genesis three. Right. Like, I'm, I'm running. I'm hiding. I don't want to be found. And um, I get to a place where I just, I'm okay. Like, I, I look like I'm okay on the outside. I start working at a gym. And again, that, the personality trait's still there. It's like, what, like, that's just who I am. Like, regardless of what I'm doing, if I'm eating wings, I'm going to eat the most or the hottest. Like, I'm going <laughs> to win. I'm going to die to win no matter what. It's just who I am. So it's like, okay, if I'm going to be a personal trainer, I'm, I'm going to be the best dang personal trainer there's ever been. Yeah. And I quickly work my way up in this gym and, you know, work my way into management and, and I'm doing okay. But at night, 
I'm not doing okay. Because the reality of what's on the internet and people mm. recognizing me and me just wanting to be a, a regular person was nearly impossible, but I was almost in denial of that. 